Welcome to the I-29 Mu Yu Dairy Podcast. I-29 Mu University is a consortium of land-grant universities in Minnesota, Iowa, South Dakota, and Nebraska. This podcast covers timely news, information, and research for today's dairy industry. As I always say, uh, the podium is yours. All right. Thanks, Fred, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to start by doing my small disclaimer. I'm an entomologist, which means that I could bore you to death or excite you with bunches of pictures of flies, mosquitoes, ticks, all the different things that are affecting your animals. But I recognize that I'm probably the only person who is listening to this or in the room that probably cares the most um, about these, these organisms. And so with that, all flies are unique and special and different. But again, I'm an entomologist. I'm not an animal scientist by training. I'm not a veterinarian. Really what I like to do is go out into the field and see, see what's there. And so that's what I'm hoping that I can kind of get across today is to get you all to go outside and look at your animals and try to see what's happening. So trying to get you all to record data to make decisions for fly management around your cow, around your animals. So I'm going to start with some open discussion. I am a formal in the classroom teacher. And so I kind of like this. And so I'm just kind of, how do you make decisions regarding fly control? I have a feeling most people do it in a similar way. You observe the cow's behavior. That's awesome. By what you're seeing, that's great. So nobody's out there like catching the fly and looking at it underneath the microscope, right? Like, like what I do, which is expected. <laughs> I don't expect you to do that. So thank you for that. So then my next question is, how do you make decisions about big purchases, like a robotic milker? Um, The University of Tennessee just bought one for one of our our farms, and I know it was a lot of money, but there was a lot of thinking involved with that. So how do you all make decisions about big purchases, either for for your farm? Economics, absolutely. Does it make sense? I know for me um, and my family, when we make big purchases, we do our homework, right? We go and we look at all of the different options that are out there and we make, yes, I love this one, discussion with a partner, uh, Minnesota, Minnesota Dairy Initiatives, visiting with other farmers. So it's not a, I'm going to go out there and spend, you know, $5,000 on something. You're going to think about it before you do that. And that's kind of what I'm really trying to get through to everybody today is to think about what they're doing when it comes to fly management before they go out and do something. So asking others, you know, sometimes we, we are our own enemy in the sense that we kind of do the same things over and over again. Sometimes it's good to kind of assess if what we're doing is actually working as well. And so this is one of the things that we've been doing here at the University of Tennessee in partner with North Carolina State University is we conducted a large dairy survey um, about, actually we did this in um, spring of 2020, um, asking producers and managers, you know, what are their serious pests on their, on their different dairy animals? And what we've really learned is that what producers are saying, what you all are saying, is that it's face flies, stable flies, and horn flies. I'm going to call these the big three for the rest of the, um, the the rest of the day and what we're seeing is that you know organic producers are having a bit more problems with fly management than compared to conventional producers and that's probably due to what's available for for fly management and the reliance on chemicals um, for control but just to give you an idea again face flies stable flies and horn flies are our extreme pests is what are serious problems in the area. Not so much cattle grubs anymore, lice, ticks, and mites, um, I will say are probably going to become a bigger pest for you all in the future. So just stay tuned on those. Be aware. As a part of that same survey, we asked producers, um, how do you determine when to start fly control? So, you know, what are they doing? What are you all doing? And really, it's kind of boiled down to time of year and when flies are first observed, when the flies are annoying the animals. Rarely is it when others recommend it. And there were a few other, a th- a few other things that were written down in the survey. But what, we ha- what we've noticed here in Tennessee, North Carolina, and other states is it's kind of more of a calendar approach um, where you think of it as, you know, hey, it's, you know, middle of March, we need to tag our animals, or maybe it's early, 
it's the middle of May, flies are coming out, let's start giving them a feed through insecticide. It's not necessarily based upon data, it's based upon convenience or um, the calendar or what others are kind of saying to them. So that's kind of what I'm hoping to get you all to think about is when you're doing this. And part of this has a lot to do with where you get your information when it comes to fly management. And as a part of that same survey, we asked people and a majority of, of y'all commented as veterinarians providing you fly control information, other farmers, which was mentioned in the chat, um, popular press as well. And sometimes I'm a little bit through the feed store too. And so I went and I found one of these popular press articles. And this really is kind of um, the same thing I've seen a few times. This is a popular press article written by an extension veterinarian. So like, awesome. This is, this is a great person who provides reliable, great feedback and more. Um, and you probably can't read it. Um, but so what I've done is I've put it over here. But the advice is primarily to use feed through insecticides, Horons, dust bags, cattle rubs, fly tags. There's a mention to not mix classes without under, without explaining what a class is. There's also a mention of using fly predators, which I would really not recommend um, for most dairy facilities, um, simply because you'd be scraping them up and throwing them away as soon as you do it if you're keeping up with your manure management. And fly traps, but not really kind of mentioning what kind. So what I want to mention to you, and I'll pause here in case somebody wants to like you know hit pause or um, take a screen capture is to visit this website. So I'm a part of a group called a Multi-State Regional Hatch Project. We're a bunch of veterinary entomologists from across the United States, and we put together all of our information onto this website, the one place where we're trying to keep it simple for producers to get to. So it's veterinaryentomology.org. That's it. You type that in and you'll get a ton of great information about flies, ticks, mosquitoes, anything on any kind of livestock. So I would recommend going there for information. As a part of that survey I mentioned a moment ago, we asked them what methods are producers currently using for pest management. And we did divide this up by organic and conventional producers based upon our survey needs. And what we learned was that a majority of our conventional producers are using feed throughs, sprays, porons, ear tags, so chemicals for fly control. Our organic producers are using an organic feed through, botanicals, essential oils, organic sprays, organic porons. So again, some kind of product for, for managing flies. A few producers are using different types of traps like fly traps, walk through traps, the fly vacuum or the fly vac or the cow vac as it's also known. I have some videos of that in a little bit or sticky tape, sticky traps in order to catch flies as, as they land on them. We did have some producers mention that they're rotating pastures, they're spreading manure, they're composting, and some are even using chickens as a part of pasture rotation so that the chickens come and feed on, on the fly larvae. Some have mentioned using injectables and vaccines. A few people mentioned using biological control agents such as dung beetles, nematodes, fungi, and parasitoids as well. But really the point here was that what we're seeing is that conventional producers are relying on chemicals for, for management of flies and organic producers are trying everything um, in order to manage the flies. And so people are making lots of decisions. That's really what I kind of want to get the point out here. And they're probably spending a lot of time and a lot of money making these decisions. And so for me, I'm a goal oriented person. My only goal for today is to get you to start thinking about making informed fly control decisions, not doing it by the calendar, not doing it by what my friend said, but by doing it by what you see, by what you observe. And some of you wrote that in the chat, and I think that's wonderful. So keep doing that. I mentioned at the very beginning that I'm an entomologist. And so the things I'm saying today can work for dairy animals as well as beef animals, um, beef cattle. So for me, all cows are kind of equal, and I know I'm not supposed to say that, but for you all, all flies are kind of equal, and so we, that's where we're going to have to kind of cross the lines right here. But so I do some work with beef cattle in Tennessee. Um, you're more than welcome to read the free article here on how we um, are recommending um, our beef producers, our cow-calf producers, to do record keeping when it comes to managing their flies. And really what it is, is creating records, right? So getting the data together, doing your homework uh, when we're done with this. You can do this in three different ways. You can look at your animals and just visually inspect them and create some kind of rating that works for you. I'm not going to tell you how to rate if it's high, low, medium, um, you know, however you want to do it. Um, you can observe the animal behavior. Somebody mentioned that in the chat. So you can see the animals actually 
attempting to avoid being eaten up by flies, right? They'll bunch, they'll swing their tails, they'll do a head toss, they'll do other things. So watching what the animals are actually telling you with their fly problems. And then probably the easiest thing, in my opinion, would be capturing the pest problem with a digital image. Most of us have cell phones with a camera on it. And so we can use our cell phones with a camera to take pictures of a few of these animals and just kind of keep up with it when you have time to see if there's a lot of flies or not that many flies. And so those are the three things I would like you to maybe think about doing. And so when it comes down to it, you know, what makes a pest a pest? And so this is something I, I wanted to take a few moments on because there's a bunch of different people who think one thing might be a pest and another thing might not be. And I say this from personal experience. My dad raised homing pigeons and would race homing pigeons um, as a part of his, his hobby. And so for us, it wasn't gross or ew. And then I was one of those kids who raised snails and I was just I was just a weirdo. I don't know how else to say it. But so for me, it was a personal perception. So what makes a pest a pest? Adapting to a new host. So sometimes we have flies or ticks that go from one area to another. So feeding on white-tailed deer, and now all of a sudden they're feeding on our dairy animals. I mentioned this kind of and briefly a moment ago, being introduced to a new region. We know in Tennessee, we have the Asian longhorn tick, Haemophysalis longicornis. It's not native to Tennessee or the United States. And so now we're dealing with this pest, this tick pest of, of cattle. The misuse or unnecessary use of insecticides, I'm going to touch on here with the next slide, because I think it's something that we kind of maybe take for granted. I know my family is very guilty of this. You know, let's just get something out and spray it and kill it when that might not necessarily be the, the best decision to do. And then people's perceptions of what's a pest and what's not really a pest. We know face flies can transmit bacteria causing pink eye, but we also know that a cow can handle quite a few face flies kind of feeding on the secretions of the eyes and, and the nose. So yeah, people's perceptions. So what does this mean when I talk about the misuse or unnecessary use of insecticides? I created this a while ago for one of my classes, and I think it kind of translates well in the extension world too, where we think about two different flies living on a cow, feeding on a cow, and just kind of doing their own thing. Both of them rely on cattle. They're obligate parasites of cattle. But in this one scenario, the clip art eye fly with the green eyes is considered to be super bad. And so what do we do when something is super bad? We're going to get out an insecticide and we're going to spray the animal. Let's say it's a poron or, or a cattle spray. So we've applied this insecticide to get rid of the green eye. Green eye dies. The population's gone and it leaves behind red eye. And so now that green eye is gone, this red eye fly has this opportunity to fill the niche that the green eye was once a part of or once filled. And so flies are going to do what flies do and that's reproduce and become abundant. And so this is what we see happening. So after a few generations, red eye is now the primary problem. So what we have here is called replacement, where a primary pest, the green-eyed fly, is gone, but the red-eye pest has now flourished and is doing a great job and has taken over. And in this one scenario, we didn't realize this before, but maybe this red-eye fly can, has the ability to transmit a pathogen and could become a bigger problem. And so this idea of replacement where we've managed one pest, but another pest has come in, is actually a really big deal right now with horn flies. And we're seeing this in the form of insecticide resistance, where horn flies um, are a primary pest on dairy animals. They're feeding on them, you know, 30, 50 times a day, lots of flies on them, lots of blood fleeting occurring. We are applying an insecticide to the animal. And then those that survive, those, those flies that survive, have become resistant to our few products that we do have. And so it's something to think about when it comes to which insecticides we use. The other thing is human attitudes. I mean, I kind of mentioned this in the form of what's tolerable and what's not. This cow here has a bunch of face flies feeding on it. And face flies really aren't a problem um, for these animals. The flies come, they feed on the secretions, you know, for a few moments at a time, and then they fly away. If they are transmitting, you know, bacteria causing pink eye, that becomes an issue. But typically, it's not a problem for these animals. Same here, we have stable flies on the legs of a calf, of, <laughs> on the legs of a calf of an animal. Few of these can actually be a huge problem. Um, the calf can stop you know, feeding and it starts like stomping around quite a bit, it becomes uncomfortable and it becomes almost a welfare behavior, a welfare problem as well. So kind of what's, what's acceptable. And so again, you know, I'm a person. And so I think about it as also as a way that a pest can change over time. 
When I was younger, my little brother was a super pest. I did not like him at all. But now that I'm older, he is a fantastic uncle and friend for us. And so, you know, it's something to think about where, you know, something that was a pest might not be a pest anymore. So this idea of this human attitude is kind of making a difference here. And we really see this with our animals. And so this is a video taken by Wes Watson out at um, NC State. And this is, again, a bunch of beef animals. But what you can see are these animals are like covered with flies. They have this animal here just tossed its head. There's hundreds of flies all on the side of this animal. That, but the animal's telling you that the flies are there and it's a problem. These animals are in the back. They're bunching up. They're not only staring at the person taking the video, but they're kind of doing this defensive behaviors. They're head tossing, they're flicking. You know, this calf here is trying to feed and is trying to nurse, but can't because the mom starts stomping quite a bit. Looking at this, these animals are bothered. This is, this is a significant problem in this, in this herd. So that I'm gonna give you a quick warning here if you aren't familiar with bots. Bots are disgusting. We can all agree on that. They're also very fascinating. But what you can see in this video is this squirrel is not affected by these bots. There's a bunch of these like flies living in that area, and I recognize it's extremely gross, but this squirrel is doing just fine eating on these sunflower seeds. So it's tolerating the fly problem here. And that's really what I kind of want to get to. Not the fact that this is disgusting, but that we have this perception that the squirrel is having a hard time feeding and surviving, but it seems to be doing just fine. So watching our animals, watching the cow that's flicking its head, that's not feeding, um, is going to be just as important. So how serious are each of these pests? And so going back to that survey idea where face flies, stable flies, and horn flies were um, described as the most important pests for y'all, you know, really, in, in my opinion, it's, it's horn flies because of their role with mastitis and transmitting different staph pathogens um, to animals. But before we get into horn flies, I do want to talk about face flies because I think a lot of producers are making management decisions because they see flies on the face of the animal. Know that the animal is not flicking its head because of flies feeding on their face. They're flicking its head because of the horn flies on the back of the animal. And so if you want to read more about face flies, um, I have a QR code here, which you're more than welcome to read on. Um, but I just have these beautiful images of, of fly larvae. And um, these eggs are laid singly. They, they hatch. The larvae go through three larval instars. So kind of thinking of it as they're little, they molt and get bigger, they molt and get bigger. And then after that, they move to the end of the, the fresh manure pot where they'll create this calcified pupa so they can't be attacked by any parasitoids. So if you're using parasitoids to try to control face flies, it's not going to work because they're not, they haven't evolved together, but the pupa itself is really hard for that parasitoid to get its ovipositor through and try to kill it. The other really important thing to remember with face flies is they love fresh manure, like straight out of the animal. Um, things that are less than 15 minutes old is a way to think about it. Whereas the horn fly is a bit different. They also like fresh manure, but they're going to like something that's a little bit older than face than the, um, the face fly manure. So something more than 15 minutes old. These also, they lay their eggs singly um, in the fresh manure, go through three larval instars and pupate, and they can be parasitized by different, by different wasps. And they have these cute, okay, so this is the entomologist in me. I apologize for the, for everybody else. They have these cute little mouth parts that allow them to kind of get into the height of the animal and get down and, and blood feed. And they do blood feed, you know, 30, 50 times a day. And that hurts the animal quite a bit, causing lots of different damage. And if you want to learn more about horn flies, um, this is a nice review article here, which you're more than welcome to read. And so I do want to mention some of the research we're doing here at the University of Tennessee when it comes to horn flies and mastitis. This is work done in conjunction with the animal scientists here. And really what we found is that more horn flies equals reduced milk quality and reduced milk yield. We were hoping to kind of create this correlation with somatic cell count, but that did not change. A somatic cell count kind of remained the same. But again, more horn flies, less milk, which is a big, which is a big deal, I hope, for you all with your economics when it comes to milk production. The same thing, we started looking at the idea of horn flies transmitting different staph pathogens to the animal, knowing that they're feeding on the animal. So when they're on the back of the animal, they're feeding up there. But when the day gets really hot, 
just like you or I or the animals, they're going to move down to the shaded area. And so that's on the udder of the animal. And so what, what Emily did was she took a bunch of quarter milk samples and we took a bunch of flies and we were able to confirm identical matches of several different staph strains within the flies feeding on the, on the animals on the udders. And to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, these are flies that have moved from the top of the animal down near the underbelly and the udders. And so they're directly feeding right into the, you know, into the capillaries, trying to get that blood meal, introducing different pathogens. So where do these flies get their pathogens? They get them up where they develop. So they basically develop with all of these staph and E. coli pathogens around them. And so they'll develop in that, the cow feed, the cow water, but really that manure. And so if the animal already has the pathogen in it, it's just going to stay on the cycle. Stable flies will develop in the bedding and calf hutches. Again, a lot of our other flies, house flies will develop in manures and separator tanks. Some of our stable flies will develop in spilled grain. So if the spilled grain gets wet, if the calf hutches get wet, which we know hutches get wet because there's calves in there, the stable flies will develop there. Our horn flies will develop in older manure and our face flies will develop in fresh manure. And so we have a bunch of different ways that we've told people or asked people to manage for flies. And, you know, I'll be honest and say, I don't think we've done this really the best way, where we're telling people to look for each individual fly species. But in reality, we know it's a systems problem where there's not likely ever going to be one fly on an animal, one species of fly. It'll be several species of flies. And so we're going to ask you all to monitor these fly populations I'm using index cards, traps, scouting, digital images. And I'll talk about those here in a moment. We already know that you're using chemical insecticides, ear tags, back rubs, and sprays. So I'm not really going to talk about that. Probably the best thing you can do, and I know dairy producers are fantastic at this, is removing the wet organic matter. And we know that's because you need to get rid of the manure to get rid of the staff and all the other E. coli pathogens, the bacteria that are in there that could hurt the animal and, and reduce the quality of your milk. Insect growth regulators, all those things that end in the ectin, are great at keeping flies as, as immatures. And so that's something you can use. There's a couple pheromones that are available to attract and kill them. But really one of the other great things, in my opinion, are using mechanical and physical controls. And so this is a larger investment up front, but it does pay down the line. So, you know, putting in window screens, creating walls, creating as exclusions, you know, maybe the animal gets to keep the tail so it can do, um, so it can swat the fly and walk through traps or a cow vac. But if you're doing these things and you're trying to manage your fly population and you're spending money on that, something to think about is just because a pest is present doesn't mean the treatment's not working. And just because the pest is absent doesn't mean that the treatment or the management option you're using actually is working. And so that's where data comes in. And I am, I love data. I've loved data my entire life. I've made graphs for everything and that's just me, but I hope you can get a little bit of my excitement when it comes to graph making. And really what we want to do is monitor our fly populations so we can make better decisions and have dis have different options even available. Because once your flies become resistant, it's going to be really hard to be able to bring in some other insecticide to use. And so with that, again, the idea, the importance of making decisions. And so if we have flies that are coming in, what we really want to avoid is having a resistant fly population replace a susceptible fly population. And so what entomologists have developed, and this has been going on for years when it comes to soybean, pests of soybean, pests of cotton, pests of corn. I overheard that the corn was getting planted this week or getting finished, I guess. I hope so. Anyway, we monitor our pests in the field over a certain amount of time. And we make these decisions on treatment based upon how bad the pest population is. And so that really kind of boils down to this idea of the economic injury level, where if the pest population kind of goes up, it goes down, it goes up and down, but it never crosses this threshold where we lose money or the cow becomes you know, um, uncomfortable, we don't need to apply a treatment. We can kind of let nature take its way. Sometimes we have things that are occasional pests, and I would say probably face flies and stable flies fall into this category, where we have, you know, populations go up, but they kind of manage themselves either with temperature, droughts, things like that. Droughts are a great way to keep flies down, unfortunately, for, for other things. But yeah, so that population goes up. But just before we reach this, the idea here is to apply the treatment. So then you can have the longer lasting effects of the treatment.
And then sometimes we have things like horn flies, which are kind of a severe chronic pest of, of our cattle, where the population is always kind of higher than the economic injury level. And so treatments need to be earlier and made with thought, made with care, so that we can keep the pest populations low or lower than they, they could be. And so there are limitations to this idea of using economic injury levels and thresholds because a lot of it's based upon yield. And so for you all, you know, milk is associated, is your yield, it's your product that you're selling. And so if we know that increased horn fly numbers reduces milk yield and milk quality, that's a problem. And so at some point, you know, we need to come up with better thresholds and injury levels to give to you all so you know when you need to make those treatments. Right now, the current number is more than 200 flies per side of an animal. The other thing is this idea of perfection, which is you know, a huge problem when it comes to humans in general. We always want things to be perfect. Low economic injury levels are not used in the decision-making process. You know, We see things like flies on the face of an animal, and so we want to go out there and spray them real quick to get those flies off, but maybe it's not a problem if there's no pink eye. It's not, it's not a big problem if there's face flies. You know, if they are transmitting pathogens or they're vectors, that becomes an issue. And then population heterogeneity, um, so be a limitation. And so, and so fly control on cattle. The idea here is to make informed decisions. And so you need to keep records and you need to select the correct active ingredients when it comes to rotating your different classes as was recommended by the extension veterinarian. Kind of moving forward with other ideas for monitoring flies around um, a parlor could be something as simple as using index cards. So flies do this really gross thing where they regurgitate and they leave fecal spots. And so this is common with face flies and house flies. And this isn't really gonna help you when it comes to horn flies or stable flies, but if you put index cards up and around your facility and you label them with the date, always put the date on, you can see how many spots there are and you know how many flies there are in that area. Other ways that you can monitor flies on your animals, and so this would be really good for stable flies and horn flies, would be counting how many flies you see on the side of an animal, creating a ranking system, or using digital images. With a camera, I can also zoom in and count the number of flies in that area which would also be great to give a, a general idea of how many flies are on your animal. So here, what I would like to suggest is that if you have a herd of 50 animals, you know, maybe pick 20 of them that become your, your monitoring animals, your sentinels, and look at 10 of them each week. So maybe you can't find the other 10, but the 10 that are easy to get to, go each week to them, take the images, do something. So you're actually starting to create records of what's working and not working on your animals, how many flies are there and aren't there. Now I'm going to take a quick detour and talk to you again about this website, veterinaryentomology.org. This is a great resource for you all when it comes to making the decisions and finding decisions and just kind of identifying flies and more. What's really great is this part of the database or part of the website called Best Pest, Best Pest X. It's a database of registered insecticides for controlling pests of animals. And so we'll visit that here in a minute. But if you were to click on that, you can choose the state. Iowa. You can choose your animals, cattle, dairy, lactating animals, choose your pest. And then from there, it'll give you a, like a list of different products available in your state that you can use for controlling horn flies on, on animals. And so earlier on, I mentioned that the veterinary um, extension, extension veterinarian said to mix, don't mix, or sorry, rotate classes was the, was the word. But what does that mean? What it really means is watching out for your IRAC codes. And so what is that? You go to this website and it tells you that these ones here are 7A and these are 3A and 7A and 15 and 3A and 1B. You wanna rotate those numbers. So if you keep a record and say, this is the product I use and this is the IRAC code, next year when you come in and get ready to make a purchase, you're using a different code. That's what it actually means. And what's awesome is you can print your results. And so if you're like me and you like data, you can get a three ring binder, print it out punch some holes in it and save it for later on when you're wondering what you did last year. You can also just print it as a PDF and save it on your computer if you want to save the trees. But it's great for helping. So record keeping can help you with resistance management. All right, so I'm going to hit escape here and hope this works. So again, super easy. Find a pest, find a pesticide, find a professional, professional resources. You want to find a pesticide. So it takes you to the Vet Pest X website. You can choose your state. I think I heard somebody was from Minnesota. So Minnesota, please indicate the type of animal. Cattle heifers. 
do. We know that stable flies and we search. And again, here it gives you all of the different products that are available to you and how you can rotate. So here it looks like there's a lot of three A's. So it'll be difficult to manage, but you can do it if you keep your records and know what you're doing. Super great website. You can change it to anything, beetles, your list changes and more. Ooh, do you see how much shorter your list got there? So integrated fly management. It's important to identify your pest and knowing what your primary pests are. But in my opinion, it's even more important to monitor your pests. You need to have a really great idea of if your populations are bad or if they're just getting bad or if you're, you know, things are fine and you can handle, your animals can handle the number of flies that are on them. There are other methods like cultural control. So minimizing the, breed, the breeding sites through sanitation and removal of wet organic material. I don't need to tell this to dairy producers because you all are fantastic at removing wet organic material. And so keep doing that and that will help reduce your flies. Mechanical controlled, creating ways that flies can't fly in to your parlor. So creating screens and barriers, killing adults before they cause harm and uh, reproducing to the next life state or not the next life state, the next generation. But again, importantly, evaluating if your different management programs are working. And that goes back to the idea of monitoring your pest populations, because there's no point in doing something if it's not working. Don't waste your money on something that is not working. You know, save it and spend it on something else. So this is where I'm going to give you guys a research ask. And so as a medical veterinary entomologist at the University of Tennessee, one of the things we're trying to do is make record keeping easier. I know it's hard because it's not done. And so what I would like to be able to do is create a visual automated kind of AI system where a computer program kind of goes in and can identify the different flies on an animal. And so we're working really closely with our engineers here at UT um, and we're, we have the first step on this. And so what we need is actually more images to validate this. And so if you're interested in taking pictures of flies on your animals or ticks on your animals or whatever you see on your animals, um, you know, please scan this QR code um, and sign up to actually um, provide some images to us because um, this is going to be a really neat way. Um, what we would love to be able to do kind of like our big dream is take a picture of the animal, upload it to the cloud, get back into your, your office area and kind of identify, you know, are, is the pest population bad and kind of create this easier record keeping idea. The big ask again, if we could get images of flies or ticks or anything on these animals, my graduate student, Katie Smith, is going to annotate those images and help develop the algorithm so that we can create this um, website for people to use. And what'll be great is we'll just actually link it to the veterinaryentomology.org website so anybody can access that. With that, I think I have a little bit of time for questions. Okay, yes, I uh, appreciate your, your time and the information you shared. A couple of questions. You In your chemicals, you, you didn't mention or I missed fly baits, uh, baits versus spray. What What's the benefit of what's your thoughts? So fly baits, fly comes, feeds on it, and then it typically doesn't die right there. It'll kind of fly away and die someplace else. I know a lot of producers don't like that. They want to see the dead fly sitting next to the fly bait. They do work, and so I would recommend them. But make sure you're looking at the different codes that are on there to make sure you're not kind of using the same things um, consistently. But fly baits are really nice for house fly control. We've had a question come in. Does the tolerance change according to the animal size, uh, cow versus calf versus newborn? So that is a fantastic question that, yes. So in my opinion, I think it does change because the calf can't feed. Um, if, it's, if it's close to the animal, think of it as a dose. And so if you have a bunch of corn flies or stable flies feeding on a smaller animal, it's going to be harder for them to kind of get to weaning weights and move on to the next part of it, its life cycle. But when it comes to a larger animal, they should be able to tolerate more. And so I like to think of flies as almost dose dependent. Okay, we've got a, another question came in. And boy, I'll murder the pronunciation. What are your thoughts on pinafin on dry manure stockpiles? I actually don't know much about that. So I have... I do not have educated thoughts on that. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> we appreciate that. On What have you seen for the efficiency or efficacy of 
flybacks. Of the flyback. Yeah. Do they really work or? They do. They they really do. When you when the it's a large investment up front. I will say that. And the electricity it takes to maintain it. And it doesn't take much in the form of labor intensive. But if you have animals kind of already going in and out and the flies are there, you know, before, how do I phrase this? Um, As the animal's coming into a parlor and the fly back is set up there, getting ready to be milked, you know, cleaning that animal off or sucking all those flies off is great. And it helps kind of keep it cleaner during the milking process. And we have seen large numbers of flies being removed pretty steadily. So each time the animal kind of walks through, maybe, well, even just once a day would be fine. But there's a lot of great data out of NC State, University of Florida, and University of Minnesota that really kind of highlight that idea of the cowback. Now, the question, if you're using fogging sprays and freestyle barns, how often should you spray? And how do you get ahead of the hatch rate of house flies? Fogging sprays are are interesting. So I'm going to read the question again to myself. How often should you spray? I would not spray that often just out of the fear of resistance happening. I would spray if the pest population says I need to, right? I don't want to say you need to do it every three weeks or every month or every week. If you have a bad fly population, try to clean up that manure first and then go into the fogging. Um, You know, try to avoid it if you can. Um, just because that will lead to really fast, rapid insecticide resistance. Uh, products such as Clarify or Altitude, uh, do they work? And what maturity of flies do they work on? Yeah, so those products do work great. You know, the animal consumes the product. It gets passed through the animal. And then when the flies go to lay their eggs in the manure where the um, where the insect growth regulators are, it's going to actually work on those immature stages of, of the fly. And so you should be seeing a reduction on the flies that are coming out of your animal's manure. Now, that being said, flies have wings. They can fly from one facility to another facility. If you have a storm roll through, they can get up in the winds and move over. And so, you know, th- those products are great. Yes, resistance can happen with Clarify and Altacid, just like any other um, chemical or any other behavior, right? So we're, we see this with mosquitoes where mosquitoes will change their behavior to not be, do, to not be killed. But kind of going back to this idea, you could have flies from another farm fly onto your farm. And so kind of maintaining a good idea of what your problem is with with records, with data, will give you an idea if it's working or not. Okay. Tell me, let's discuss uh, how many products do we need to put in that rotation to help defend against resistance? And should that even be on a weekly or monthly basis? So when you say products, are you asking because the the classes, yes, yeah, yeah. let's go to this because I have it open still. So let's go to horn flies search. And so you don't want to rotate them every month, right? Because you think of this population as kind of a a long population of flies. What you want to do is rotate every other year would be great or every two years. So if you have these ones here, Y-Texas or um, Invinco's you know, 7A, 3A, all of these permethrins, you know, rotating two years later with the diflubenzeron would be great. So if you're giving them a permethrin and a diflubenzeron at the same time, you are controlling your flies, but you're also going to be creating resistance relatively quickly. There is... I'm going to also throw out there that every farm is different. Every producer situation is different. And so you might have to do that to keep your fly population down. I know we've seen at some of our Tennessee farms quite a bit of resistance developing by the end of the season. And so kind of, I don't know, this is a problem that we're going to be having for a long time. I don't have a clear answer for you on how often you should be rotating. But using two at a time just encourages resistance. And if we rotate too often, that's not going to help us either. I mean, it will control flies, but. Correct. Yeah. I'm thinking long game. Cunifin is a live larvicide product that they use on stockpots, which sounds like a really good idea when you have yeah. <laughs> stockpiles the way we do in Northwest Iowa. 
and there are some people testing out um, new products all the time. So what's great is our, our companies are recognizing that, you know, we only have a, a small suite of products available or types of um, insecticides available. And so, you know, they're working really hard with university and government researchers to evaluate them and get new things out on the market. Is Will there be any changes in the near future on the licensing and how we can acquire these products? That is outside of my pay grade. I okay. have. <laughs> And I, and I I say that knowing that, you know, last year we almost lost permethrin. And so if we would have lost permethrin products last year, it would have been a disaster for the entire livestock industry. Thankfully, we didn't, but it is something that we we're aware of. And as I think the last question came in, is a poron effective if you're using sprinklers on the cows? So are you putting the poron into the sprinkler? Is that how it's working? Or are you using it as to cool the animals off? This is me being an entomologist. <laughs> the sprinklers ought to keep the animal from heat stressing. Oh, but, yes, uh, that should work. That should work just fine. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay. Well, yeah, heat stress is, a, is, in my opinion, a bigger deal for dairy animals than flies. But the flies are a compounding factor when it comes to heat stress. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Becky, for your time in presenting the information. Thank you to our listeners. We appreciate uh, you coming back uh, time after time and look forward to seeing you next month uh, for our I-29 uh, MUU. We're going to be talking about uh, what we're seeing for changes in milk pricing and in the federal milk market orders hearings. So look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. This right. will conclude. Thanks for having me, y'all. I-29 MUU is an equal opportunity provider. For the full non-discrimination statement or accommodation inquiries, go to extension.iastate.edu forward slash diversity forward slash EXT.